Greetings and welcome to Ebenezer Baptist Church on Fraser Street, uh, Vancouver, for our weekly uh, service of worship. Uh, wherever you are, whatever your current situation right now, we're delighted that you have chosen uh, to join us for this service. And we would invite you uh, to join in the hymns and songs and in the response to the prayers um, whenever you have opportunity. Whenever we gather for worship, we can do so with the wonderful confidence and assurance that Christ is with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So our call to worship from Psalm 95 today invites us to welcome Jesus as our good shepherd who cares for us and leads us right into eternity with him. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And we continue with our opening hymn, Our Great Saviour. That's number 57 in your hymn book, if you happen to be following in the Ebenezer hymn book at home. Hallelujah, what a savior, what a friend. Savior. 
says in the words of this song that lost or saved find a way at the sound of your great name. Lost or saved, lost or saved. the sound of your great name, all condemned, feel no shame, at the sound of your great name, every fear has no i 
Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we do thank you that we can gather today in the name of Jesus, in his great name. We thank you that in the words of our opening hymn, he is indeed a friend for sinners, a strength in weakness, help in sorrow, our guide and keeper and therefore we do now adore him and we pray that as we join together in worship and word and prayer you would draw near to us all in a very special way touch our minds and our hearts by the power of your holy spirit and Bring us closer to the one in whose name we gather, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And today's reading, as we continue our series in Mark's Gospel, is from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 37. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could barely talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, 
Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Grant, O Lord, that in the written word and through my spoken words, we may see and behold the living word, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray, by your Spirit. Amen. Some 75 years ago, the late Elie Wiesel was a 15-year-old prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp. And in his memorable book, Night, he wrote about his life there. A particularly powerful story was about a young servant boy, a pipple, as they were called. He was cruelly tortured, and when he wouldn't reveal any information, the SS sentenced the child to death, along with two other prisoners who had been discovered with arms. As Wiesel Wiesel continues the story, and I quote, One day, when we came back from work, we saw three gallows rearing up in the assembly place, three black crows, roll call, SS all around us, machine guns trained, the traditional ceremony, three victims in chains, and one of them, the little servant, the sad-eyed angel. The SS seemed more preoccupied, more disturbed than usual. To hang a young boy in front of thousands of spectators was no light matter. The head of the camp read the verdict. All eyes were on the child. He was lividly pale, almost calm, biting his lips. The gallows threw its shadow over him. This time, the Lega Capo, who was a prison functionary himself refused to act as executioner. Three SS replaced him. The three victims mounted together onto the chairs. The three necks were placed at the same moment within the nooses. Long live liberty, cried the two adults. But the child was silent. Where is God? Where is he? Someone behind me asked, Wiesel continues, total silence throughout the camp. On the horizon, the sun was setting. Bear your heads, yelled the head of the camp. His voice was raucous. We were weeping. Cover your heads. Then the march past began. The two adults were no longer alive, but being so light, the child still was. For more than half an hour, he stayed there, struggling between life and death, dying in slow agony under our eyes. And we had to look him full in the face. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, where is God now? Where is God now? We'll hear Wiesel's response to this cry of despair later. But though the circumstances were so extreme that we can barely even imagine them, the man's reaction 
of course, was far from unique. Most of us struggle with the problem of evil at some points in our lives. When we see all the sickness and suffering in our world right now, for example, or closer to home in people's personal lives, we can easily wonder where God is. What's God doing? We can even doubt whether there is a good God at all when so much seems to be so bad in so many places. And our doubts can become especially challenging, can't they, when we experience significant suffering ourselves. That's one of the reasons why I find it so important to remember the bigger picture of how Jesus can and has already changed things for the better. However difficult our current situation. And in today's reading from Mark chapter 7, we find two powerful and very personal examples. As he addresses the suffering of one woman and her daughter, who is literally tormented by evil, and heals a man who cannot hear and barely speaks. And what we discover when we explore this passage is that Jesus not only calls things as they are and accepts the harsh realities of the human condition, he goes two steps further. He acts in compassion to respond to them. And in the process, he asserts his amazing, awe-inspiring authority to deal with them. I guess that most of us like to consider ourselves realists, but if pressed, we may also admit that we can be as guilty of refusing to recognize the reality of our problems as anyone else. In that sense, there can be a lot of truth in the old saying that denial is not just a river in Egypt. And guilt and shame can be a, have a powerful role in promoting it. Ever since the Garden of Eden, secrecy has been the natural accompaniment of wrongdoing. When we, we make mistakes, it's a predictable reaction to try to cover them up. And when we face problems, it can be easier to deny their consequences, even their existence, than to confront them openly. But thankfully, that's not how Jesus works. Immediately before our reading, as we considered last week, he's been speaking about the deep challenges of humanity, given all our obvious faults and weaknesses. Some local religious leaders have been complaining that the disciples don't ritually wash their hands properly before meals. And Jesus has made a significant distinction between legalistic observances or traditions, which have no ethical value in and of themselves, and much more important moral requirements to take care of others and avoid harming them. Jesus consistently reminds us that it's not the externals of our behavior or our religion that really count, but how we live our lives and how we do so will ultimately boil down to questions of the heart, to issues of motivation. We all know this. However skillfully we may put our best foot forward, we can wrestle with more internal struggles, and there can be times when we let ourselves down, even surprise ourselves by what we say or do. I once heard a prominent preacher tell his congregation that if they knew what sometimes went on in his heart, they wouldn't listen to a word he had to say. That was probably the most honest statement that I've ever heard from a pulpit. And it's surely true for all of us, more or less. 
We all make mistakes. We all let ourselves down. And it's so often the private, hidden motivations of our hearts that present the greatest problem. So if you want to change things for the better, we surely need to start by looking at the man or woman in the mirror, as the old pop song has it. We have to begin by being realistic about who and where we are. That's certainly what Jesus does with those around him. He accepts and calls the reality of sin, evil, and suffering in our world for what they are, including our part in them. But thankfully, he doesn't stop there because he also goes on to do something incredibly powerful, totally life-changing in the process. Which brings me to my second point and the vital importance of acting in compassion. Acting in compassion. One of my former mentors in the UK once told me that God will always stretch us, but not to breaking point without very good reason. Over the years, I found that to be true in many areas of ministry, especially in outreach to others. And one of the main challenges is that there are simply times for all of us when we just don't feel ready or responsible to be of service in particular situations. That's partly the case for Jesus in our reading, I think, although he eventually gets over his seeming reluctance. When he enters the non-Jewish or Gentile region of Tyre, according to verses 24 to 25, he goes into a house and doesn't want anyone to know it. But he cannot keep his presence secret because as soon as she hears about him, a woman whose little daughter is possessed by an evil spirit comes and falls at his feet. What is more, this woman is a Greek from Syrophoenicia, not a Jew, and her approach is very strong and direct, we learn in verse 26. She doesn't just ask, she begs. She pleads for Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But at first, Jesus refuses an equally strong and today perhaps rather harsh-sounding terms. First, let the children eat all they want, he tells her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. The reference here seems to be to Jesus' understanding of his own primary calling, which we sometimes forget as the other main account of this miracle in Matthew 15 makes clear. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he says in verse 24 of that chapter. In other words, although it has universal application and extension, thank God for that, Jesus sees his first mission during his earthly ministry, as we read elsewhere in the New Testament, as to preach the good news of God's kingdom to the Jewish people. So as a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, the woman with the tormented daughter apparently falls outside his mandate, and she's not an obvious candidate for Jesus' help, especially when he's seeking a period of quiet retreat, as we know he is. But then we see him change his approach. And why, why does he do that? Basically because the woman's words in verse 28 so, so, show such faith in Jesus' ability to deliver her daughter as well as boldness in her special pleading. Yes, Lord, she replies, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter, Jesus says to her in verse 29 of Mark 7. 
Woman, great is your faith, he adds in Matthew 15, verse 28. And from the moment Jesus utters those words, the girl's condition is changed dramatically. The girl is immediately delivered, verse 30 tells us, and her mother goes home and finds her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Imagine how she must have felt at that moment. So there are a number of lessons that we, we might learn from this incident about the importance of persisting in prayer, even when the prospects for a favorable outcome don't seem promising, or about the significance of praying in faith and really believing that God can answer our prayers and trusting that God is with us. Yet the point I want to emphasize concerns another reason for Jesus' apparent change of mind. You see, Jesus clearly doesn't have to deliver the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. He actually has reason not to respond to her plea for help. But when the woman persists, when she shows that she believes Jesus capable of making a difference, he chooses to act. He chooses to act, confronted by someone whose daughter is literally tormented. He's so moved by her faith and his love for her that he intervenes dramatically right then and right there. To put this another way, Jesus acts out of compassion. We should never, ever forget that marvelous truth. He really cares about the suffering of the girl and her mother, and he responds decisively in love, not just to them, but to so many, literally billions of people down through the ages. And though we may never be called to exercise the same kind of dramatic ministry, we surely face similar choices when we meet the human suffering that comes our way. We may not welcome it. We may not always feel inclined or even responsible to do anything about it. And we may have good reasons. But if we share... Jesus' compassion, we can't do everything, we can never do that, but we can choose to act, and that can make all the difference in the world. Which brings us to the third and perhaps most surprising strategy of part of Jesus' strategy against evil in Mark 7. For he not only takes compassionate action to address human suffering, he asserts and exercises his authority in the process. We don't always remember this, but the biblical understanding is that every force of evil in this world, however powerful, and we can see plenty of evidence of this power, is already a defeated foe from a spiritual perspective. And one of the best illustrations of where we are spiritually, which I've shared before, comes from the history of World War II. In last year's 75th anniversary year, we had ample opportunity to remember that however tough at the time, D-Day on June the 6th, 1944, when the Allied troops invaded Normandy in France was the decisive initiative in breaking the back of the Nazi Third Reich and all its horrors. And it was so decisive because it was at that point that the Allies re-established their presence in France, broke through enemy lines and put Hitler's forces on the defensive all the way back to Berlin. In one sense, one could even argue that the Second World War was won on D-Day, although total victory and a complete surrender of all enemy combatants wasn't achieved until May 8, 1945, with victory in Europe, followed by 
the surrender of Japan on August 14th. A great deal remained to be accomplished after D-Day, of course, and achieving it was very, very costly in terms of human lives lost on both sides. But the Allies were already victorious, and total conquest was arguably just a matter of time. If we think about the big picture in the New Testament, we discover that we're now in a similar kind of situation spiritually. You see, when Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins and rise again on the third day, Colossians 2 verse 14 tells us that he disarmed the powers and authorities of evil and triumphed over them. He triumphed over them. By dying to bring forgiveness and eternal life, Christ conquered sin and death once and for all. And by rising again, he sealed that victory forever. And one of the most powerful ways in which Christ has demonstrated and asserted this authority is by miraculously setting people free from the sway and control of evil by ministering healing and deliverance. We see this in verses 24 to 30, where Jesus doesn't even have to visit the woman's daughter or lay hands on her to put an end to her torment. All he says is, the demon has left your daughter. Or in Matthew 15, verse 28, your request is granted. Your request is is granted and the girl is healed and delivered instantaneously. We see the same pattern in the healing of the deaf and mute man after Jesus leaves the Tyre area and goes back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis, which were ten cities located to the east and northeast of Galilee and the River Jordan. So he's back in more familiar territory here. And according to verse 32 following, when some people bring to him a man who is deaf and can hardly talk, and they beg him to place his hand on the man, Jesus doesn't hesitate to respond. What is more, just as with the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus acts in compassion swiftly and decisively. After he takes him aside, Away from the crowd, Jesus puts his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spits and touches the man's tongue. He looks up to heaven and with a deep sigh says to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And what's the amazing response? At this, we read in verse 35, the man's ears are opened, his tongue is loosened, and he begins to speak plainly. Let me repeat that. Jesus says to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears are opened, his tongue is loosened, and he begins to speak plainly. What wonder-working power, what awesome authority and it's all and only possible of course because Jesus was and is the living son of God ministering through miraculous means so the kingdom of God which is a kingdom of healing and liberation comfort and peace comes in his very person and in and through his death and resurrection he goes on to demonstrate his triumph over sin and death by giving his life in our place and rising again miraculously at the first Easter. It's not surprising then that as we read in verses 36 and 37, even when Jesus commands them not to tell anyone, the more he does so, the more people keep talking about it. They're overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they say. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So a major part of the great good news that I want to leave with you is that through faith in Christ, we can share 
this wonderful message, and perhaps especially at times like this, people need to hear it so badly. We can also, to come to my final point, become part of the solution. We can enjoy the benefits of Christ's authority over the powers of darkness. In this fallen world, we obviously can't expect to face, to escape suffering, sickness, or to resolve all its problems overnight. But God is with us. God is with us. In one sense, the battle has already been won and we're on the winning side and we have the amazing, life-giving opportunity to live out Christ's victory right here, right now. So there we have it. Christ's three-part strategy of accepting evil for what it is, acting in compassion and asserting his divine authority. And we can share and participate in it. When Elie Wiesel witnessed the three terrible hangings in a concentration camp, including that of a child with which we began, he could understand why the man cried out, where is God? Where is God now? Many would have asked exactly the same question in such an awful, unimaginably awful situation. It's the kind of terrible predicament that may cause many to doubt, even seemingly to lose their faith. I remember a senior Christian leader once tell the sad story of how his own father was totally alienated from the church after undergoing dreadful suffering in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. But Wiesel came to a different, very profound realization when he heard the words, where is God? Where is God now? I heard a voice within me, he writes in his book, Night. I heard a voice within me answer him, where is he? Here he is. He is hanging here on this gallows. He is hanging here on this gallows. Here God is. In other words, Wiesel saw God himself the God whom Christians recognize in the Lord Jesus Christ, who quite literally bore the pain and paid the price for the sin of the whole world on the cross of Calvary, suffering in and with those so cruelly executed in a Nazi concentration camp. And we can surely do the same whenever we witness or experience human suffering in a situation like the current COVID-19 crisis or any other, we can rest assured that Christ is with us. Christ is with whoever suffers, whatever their situation. But Mark 7 also reminds us that we don't have to leave things there because Jesus has also provided the ultimate answer to all the disease, all the suffering in our world. Through his miraculous and wonder-working ministry, he has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he has broken the bonds of sin, sickness, and evil, that he can set people free from them, and that he can bring healing and deliverance where none otherwise seems possible. All that he asks, all that he ever asks, is that we be willing to enter into a living, loving relationship with him, that we be ready to share his gifts with others. So as we try to accept evil and suffering for what they are, we too can choose to act in compassion like Jesus 
and we can even join with him as he asserts his unique divine authority over all that would counter his wonderful kingdom of love, healing, and wholeness. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you for the wonderful truth that Jesus came to bring life and hope and comfort and healing and deliverance. And we thank you that he has done so. By his death and resurrection, he has conquered death and evil once and for all. And Lord, we can participate in his triumph. Help us wherever we are, whatever our situation right now, Lord, to be as ready as he was to act in compassion, to accept the realities that we face around us, but then to reach out to show compassion and to do all this in the mighty name of Jesus himself. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to heal and restore. Hallelujah.
Let us pray. And today's pastoral prayer is based on one originally written by John Birch. The response to the words, as we bow down, is we pray to God our Maker. We bow down, we pray to God our Maker, and I'd encourage you to join in these responses. Loving God, we thank you that Jesus is our good shepherd and within his embrace we are safe and secure. By grace through faith in him, we know that we are precious in your sight so we can feel the warmth of family and belonging as we grow and are nurtured together as one flock, the people of your pasture under your loving care and protection. As we bow down, we pray to God our maker. Amen. Jesus, our good shepherd, you give us so many gifts and you bless us in so many ways that we can never fully express the gratitude that you deserve. We are so thankful that you lead us in prayer by example and by your spirit, as even now you are at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So we bring you our heartfelt thanks and praise for all your goodness to us. As we bow down, we, we pray to God, God our, our maker. maker. Jesus, our good shepherd, you love us so much that you gave your life for us before you rose again to save us from the penalty and power of sin. But we worship a holy as well as a merciful God, and our sins can separate and divide us. So we ask you, loving Father, to forgive our sins and offenses against you and against one another, Lord, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. As we bow down, we pray, we pray to, to God, God our Maker. Maker. Jesus, our good shepherd, within your embrace we find justice. So we pray for our leaders at all levels of government. Guide and direct them, we pray, and help them to make wise and positive decisions especially during the current health crisis. We particularly lift up those who have dedicated their lives to the search for peace and reconciliation and to research in the health scientists, sciences. We remember all victims of strife, warfare, and violence, including the victims of the terrible events in Nova Scotia last weekend and their grieving families and communities all who have been imprisoned or tortured for their faith, and Christians everywhere who have taken up the cross and know its weight and pain. As we bow down, we, we pray, pray to, to God, God our, our Maker. Maker. Jesus, our Good Shepherd, you are the head of the church and you have promised that you will never lead us astray. So we pray for the world church, for our faith community here at Ebenezer, for leaders and staff, and for our different ministries and outreach, as well as for missionaries overseas. Strengthen and empower us by your Holy Spirit that we may become an ever more spirit-filled community, serving Christ and glorifying him in all that we say and do. As we bow down, we, we pray, pray to, to God, God our Maker. Maker. Jesus, our Good Shepherd, within your embrace we find comfort and healing. So we bring to you those who are weak or struggling with physical, mental, or spiritual health. You are the great healer, and we pray for healing of mind and body for those we now name in the silence of our hearts, beginning with those in our immediate communities and families, and all stricken with the COVID-19 virus. As we bow down, we pray to God, our Maker. 
Finally, Jesus, our good shepherd, within your embrace, we can find plenty. As we continue to give to the church, we ask you to use our gifts for the good of others and for your glory. And may we never be slow to share what you have so freely shared with us. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. And our closing hymn is Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And the chorus which speaks, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed. As we draw to a close of this time of worship together, I want to thank you uh, for joining us. 
and invite you to find out more about Ebenezer by going to our website, rockofhelp.com. There you can also find information about how to give to the church and a Zoom Bible study, uh, which we've been running weekly, and we invite you to participate in. And as we continue to walk through this difficult time together, but also a time when we perhaps have more pause to reflect than normal, I'd encourage you to focus on the great good news of the gospel, that our risen Lord Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. And so he ministers to us day by day. He acts in compassion. He exercises his authority. All he ever asks is that we turn to him and then he invites us into a wonderful new life and an exciting spiritual journey that takes us right into eternity. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb and I'm welcomed with open arms praise God just as